And California still uses a lot of water too. A two million acre feet uh, of uh, Colorado River water. Among other things, we ship a bunch of it to the Imperial Valley uh, where we grow subsidized alfalfa, which I'm not kidding you, we put in shipping containers and send to China to subsidize their dairy industry. Uh, there's a lot of hilarious inefficiencies around markets, uh, around water markets that will cease to be funny when people turn the tap to the right and no water comes out. Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey, Rick, it's good to have you back on the channel today. Pleasure to be with you, gentlemen. Thank you for having me back. Thank you. I feel, feel like we're family now. That's it. <laughs> That's good. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing very well. I feel like the uh, the unwanted neighbor that just showed up on the doorstep. <laughs> we're very inclusive here. <laughs> yes, the all black, weird people black, well. white, and Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so uh, today, you know, I wanted to <clears throat> jump into a few things. I, I've heard I've heard you talk about uh, water as. Um, you know, in the situation around water in the United States, it sounds very dire. And I heard you talk about this in a video that was from 2017. And this is, we're in 2023, going in 2024. And obviously, there still hasn't been any investment into um, a lot of uh, these spaces and these commodities that, that we need to live. And so I wanted to get... Um, an update from you of what you're seeing with, with water and is there any way to, to play this as an investment uh, for investors out there? Well, this is certainly a crisis looking for a place to happen. And I'm afraid that it's going to come and visit a neighborhood near you. Now, Daryl, maybe not near you. You live in Seattle where the problem is often making the water go away as opposed to getting access to it. But for much of the country, uh, it, it is a problem. Uh, and the problem and the opportunity is probably the same, uh, the mismatch between settlement and the availability of water. To make water an investable theme, it, you have to have a pr couple preconditions. First of all, there has to be a scarcity of it. You know, it's unlikely you're going to have a water problem in southern Louisiana. Uh, at the same time that there has to be a scarcity, there has to be the ability of the society to afford it. There's a water crisis in Yemen. There's a water crisis in Somalia. There's a water crisis in Afghanistan, but there's not enough money that you could get paid to address it as an investor. So you have to have scarcity <laughs> and you have to have money. Now, that means, among other things, the Western U.S. and the Southwestern U.S., where there is both a scarcity and there is a lot of money. A few things that you need to understand uh, in order to understand water markets. The first is that in the state of California, as an example, 85% of the water consumed contributes to 3% of state GDP. 85% of the water used in the state of California goes to agriculture, and agriculture contributes 3% of GDP. I'm not suggesting that we deny water to the farmers. I'm simply stating the arithmetic fact. Also in California, legislation is on the books dating back well over 100 years when the California farmers were the dominant vote in the state, that apportions water by use, not by utility. So it is perfectly feasible because of politics in the state of California to spend $100 an acre foot for water growing alfalfa in the desert while denying an urban user that same water for brushing teeth or flushing toilets at $800 an acre foot. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense. It's political. And you need to understand that the great bugaboo of supply and the great bugaboo of economics and water is politics. You need to understand further, and I'm sorry to give you all this at once, uh, but I guess it's the most economical way to give it to you, that water is absolutely controlled politically. Water doesn't flow downhill to gravity. It flows uphill to votes. And that provides a couple disciplines. Most water is owned and distributed politically. And it means that the water rates may or may not be sufficient 
but the water rates flow into the general revenues to be spent by politicians in ways that gather votes today. Ensuring a water supply uh, 50 years from now, when that politician will probably be dead, but at least out of, auction, out of option, auction, uh, office, is not as attractive as spending the money from water rates on things that will attract votes today. And what that means is that while water costs always go up, the investments made by politicians in water investments never goes up. The municipal water distribution supply in Seattle was built in the 1920s. <laughs> the population of Seattle, not surprisingly, has grown since the 1920s. And that infrastructure hasn't been maintained. Seattle mercifully has access to a lot of water. And Seattle can afford the leakage that occurs in its infrastructure as a consequence of 100 years of underfunded repair and maintenance. Los Angeles, which has the same sins, cannot afford the infrastructure that Los Angeles currently has. The problem with regards to water is that you have enough until you don't. If you'll remember, uh, Daryl, and perhaps you weren't old enough to remember, but California some years ago had an electricity crisis. The political leaders of California, in their genius, <clears throat> deregulated the price that utilities could pay for electricity, but not the price that they could charge. And they decoupled generation from distribution, which meant that the California utilities were in the odd position of paying retail and selling for wholesale. When <laughs> That meant that we had a shortage of electricity in California and the lights were out. The Californians went to the Canadians and said, please, gentlemen, we're out of electricity. We will, glad you pay you th we will gladly pay you Thursday for the electricity that we consume today. And of course, because electricity uh, isn't capital intensive to distribute, it comes across wires. The Canadians sent us lots and lots and lots of electricity, which we promptly neglected to pay them for. You can't do that with water. If we ran out of water in California and we wanted to import Canadian water, we would first have to build aqueducts from Canada to California. So we couldn't address the problem with the swift flip of a switch, uh, which we did with regards to electricity. Thus far, we haven't had a problem. And speaking parenthetically, just about California, but uh, continuing the lessons from California on to any water short part of the world, the difficulty that we have continues as a political difficulty. You don't have a problem until you have a problem. And when you have a problem, it takes a decade and billions of dollars to fix the problem, which means that when you have a problem, you have a real serious problem and you have a political problem because we haven't had a severe supply shortage in California. We haven't dealt with the fact that we pay a less amount of money to grow subsidized crops in a desert than we do to flush toilets and, blood, uh, and, and brush teeth. One of the problems with regards to water is that it's priced politically for votes, not with regards to utility. If you had a free market in water, which is to say if the urban user competed with the rural user, in California, in the western half of the Central Valley where there isn't any water, there wouldn't be any crops and we wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> But that isn't what happens. And we're going to have a problem. I don't know when we're going to have a problem, but I know that we're going to have a problem. And I have no earthly idea how we're going to address the problem. I personally, and this doesn't work for your viewers, I personally have addressed the problem by buying water rights for 35 years. So I personally have a water portfolio. I had assumed mistakenly that eventually we would have a political reckoning and I would be able to sell my rural water rights to urban users. That never happened. What did happen is it was much more like buying an apartment building. The rents on the water went up every year. And it turns out to have been a very, very, very good investment for reasons that I had never anticipated. Uh, it is also true for people who are interested in the water as a resource that you can buy, uh, and pardon the political incorrectness of this response, but you can buy water companies in drag. You can buy farming companies that own water rights for the purpose of growing crops, 
but own the water. And in the event of any political uh, reapportioning of water, you would benefit. And yes, those companies have names. One is Limonera. Uh, I think the symbol is L-M-N-R, I think. Limonera is a company that controls 2,200 acres of cropland in Ventura County, California, where they grow avocados and citrus. But in the next 10 years, they'll grow single family residential developments. And they own the water pertinent to those citrus operations, water rights, uh, which I think will become increasingly valuable over time. The granddaddy of the California water stocks, however, is J.G. Boswell and company. Boswell is interesting. It isn't public, uh, except that it was formed a long time ago. And as a consequence of uh, Malthusian reasons, Boswell beget Boswell, beget Boswell, beget Boswell, there are enough shareholders that the company trades, irrespective of the market. This is the largest farming co company in California, and I believe the largest private water rights owner in California. Now, at present, they use that water to do things like grow cotton and grow tomatoes. Uh, in other words, they degrade the resource by beneficiating it through agriculture. <laughs> uh, it may be over time that if you have a political reckoning in California around water and a free market develops, that Boswell will be able to monetize their water right. The other more likely outcome is that we'll have a political crisis around water and uh, uh, Governor Grusom, uh, who runs the state of California, will merely steal Boswell's, Boswell's water to redistribute it to voters. Uh, I will leave it to your audience to determine which outcome is more likely. I'm hoping against hope that the rule of law and decency prevails, and I am a Boswell shareholder. Man, man, what does this look like for <clears throat> cities like, you know, Phoenix and uh, the Colorado River? Hey, everyone, sorry for the break in action, but I have to let you know that I am now an affiliate with Miles Franklin. Miles Franklin has been a bullion dealer for over 30 years, and they provide some of the highest quality service to their clients, as well as fair pricing on bullion products. So purchasing bullion through Miles Franklin not only stores wealth for yourself, but you're also supporting this channel to continue to provide free educational material for retail investors and those who may not be aware of many financial concepts that I discuss on this channel. So you can get started by sending an email to info at milesfranklin.com or calling 952-929-7006. Be sure to let them know that Daryl Thomas or the Money Level Show sent you and I will receive credit for your service. I thank you all for considering this. Now let's get back to the interview. And like the, those populations have boomed. I think you and I talked about, I think I mentioned like I was, I'm thinking about moving down there, you know, all my family's there and, and, uh, you know, I yeah, kind of pumped the brakes after learning a little bit. <laughs> it, could, it could be a full on mess. Uh, I, I shouldn't be smiling about this because it's tragic, but the comedy of it always overwhelms me. The, uh, Colorado river was apportioned by the U S army Corps of engineers. I believe it was back in the 1920s, but I might be wrong. And it was based on some very good hydrological studies that were done in terms of the river flow. The problem was that during the period that they did those studies, those were record high periods of water flow for the river. So the river has been assigned as to about 120% of its capacity, which is pretty hard on the river uh, to the extent that often when the Colorado River hits the Mexican border, there's no water left in it. Mexicans don't vote in the United States. Well, they don't vote legally in the United States, of course. And, and so the Mexicans were low bid uh, in that part of politics that's an election, advanced auctions of stolen property. It wasn't a problem, the apportionment, uh, through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, because the allocations that went to states like uh, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Nevada didn't matter because there was no folks that lived there. You know, all the water went to California, who used it. And California assigned themselves senior water rights by paying a disproportional share of the capital involved in building the storage facilities. These days, there's a lot of claimants. There's this little town that didn't used to exist. I think it's called Phoenix. Uh, there's another one called Tucson. There's one called Las Vegas. You might be familiar with that, that uh, big row of golf courses and fountains in the desert. And all these places use water. 
All these places use water. And California still uses a lot of water too. A two million acre feet uh, of uh, Colorado River water. Among other things, we ship a bunch of it to the Imperial Valley uh, where we grow subsidized alfalfa, which I'm not kidding you, we put in shipping containers and send to China to subsidize their dairy industry. Uh, there's a lot of hilarious inefficiencies around markets, uh, around water markets that will cease to be funny when people turn the tap to the right and no water comes out. Uh, one of the reasons, certainly not the only reason, but one of the reasons that I moved to rural Washington is I didn't want to be part of that experience. <laughs> Despite the fact that I live in a high rainfall area and my domestic water is furnished by a well, which I pull at about, I don't know, 10% of capacity. I also capture all my rooftop water <laughs> in a pila or reservoir. So I have elected to take the coming water shortage personally and to insulate myself against it, first of all, by living in a place where there's a lot of rain, but second of all, by expending a substantial amount of capital to make sure that a, a water shortage isn't even an inconvenience for me. Um, people without my means, people who are forced by circumstance or choice to live in places where there are water shortages, people who are reliant on the community for water are going to have some challenges because the dispute, at least initially, isn't going to be solved by a free market, which, while messy, would work. The problem will be solved politically, which A, won't work, and will be also be messy. And I have no idea how we get around that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a um, very uh, grim, truthful picture there. Um, ben, you, did you have anything you wanted to chime in on? Uh, no, I was just interested to uh, to hear about the age of the infrastructure around water. And I'm wondering if you call them companies in drag, what are the perhaps indirect ways? Are they pick and shovel ways of playing this um, mm -hmm. coming thesis? I mean, it's got to, it's got to be rectified at some stage. Are there any like infrastructure service companies that one might uh, invest in? Ben, there may very well be. Uh, I've proven to myself in 50 years that my track record in analyzing process and technology is unblemished by success. So I don't allow myself to get in that part of the portfolio. Uh, it could be that younger, more facile uh, analysts could point you to any number of water plays around process and technology. Filtration plays is an example. The only one of those that I have ever uh, disgraced with my presence was, li was Lindsay Irrigation, uh, which I consider sort of a farm service stock. And I bought as a consequence of the fact that I have been a consumer of their products and found them better than any competing product. Not a very sophisticated analysis. That was a starting point for Peter Lynch. I think he bought Spanx when he, his wife was raving about the product and he, he said, well, this is a, a, an interesting starting point. Well, perhaps uh, that might lead to a, a, a more broader segment view. I'm interested to know some of the things we've talked about in the past. Where, would, where do you think the relative value is in playing this oncoming theme? Is it in the soft commodities, be it water, grains? Is it in the metals, precious or industrial? Or is it just purely in energy uh, where we, it seems to be the key ingredient to all the above? I'm interested to see how you view. Uh, there was a time in my life when I was more thematic, uh, which suggested that I had the bandwidth to cover all of those subjects equally. I, I've learned to my chagrin that my biggest investment risk is located to the left of my right ear and to the right of my left ear. And so I allocate money now based on my competitive advantage relative to other investors. I've spent 50 years coming to understand natural resources, in particular, extractive natural resources. So I'm attracted to the energy business and the mining business, not because it's necessarily more attractive as a business, but rather because I have more faith in my ability to analyze it. Uh, so I may be the wrong one to ask the sector question too, given that I confine myself to sectors where I'm not afraid of my own ignorance. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, water is obviously one key ingredient into growing crops, and we have a growing population. Uh, are there ways in which you're playing the food slash agricultural thematic 
I am doing that. I have for a very long time been a passive investor in farmland. There was a time in my youth when I was an active investor in farmland. And believe me, I've stretched my last fence at age 70. So I'm an investor in farmland, which is leased to farmers. And there was a point in time where all of my passive investments in farmland were in California because it was the market that I understood best. And because I preferred the economics of things like avocados and garbanza and garlic to commodity crops, uh, I am now confining my investments in agriculture uh, precisely to commodity crops and precisely in areas like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and the upper Midwest, where the farmers have durable competitive advantage, including durable competitive advantage around water. Uh, a whole bunch of annual crops in the United States are produced around something called the Ogallala Aquifer, a, a big water-bearing formation that stretches through Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado. And the problem is that the water there is being mined. It's being pumped out of the aquifer much more rapidly than the aquifer is being increased through precipitation and percolation. The consequence of that is that the, although the weather is better in the West, uh, and the Western producers have been lower cost producers in things like grains and cotton, I think that the benefit over the next 20 years shifts to producers of cotton in the South, although the weather's worse, and producers of grain in the upper Midwest, because precisely they will have less of an issue with water than we're having in the West. So for me, there is a thematic. And sticking with, uh, sticking with water, I've been doing a bit of reading. Jim Davalos did a great deep dive on Texas Pacific land. And it, it's kind of an interesting one. Not many people necessarily think of it as a water company per se, but it's its ability to own land doing essentially what you're doing. They're taking royalties. And now uh, from 2015, where 6% of their revenues came from water provision and recycling, I understand it's a different use than agriculture. It's now become about a third of its revenues. Uh, I'd be super interested to get your take on this uh, very peculiar company. I wasn't aware that that share of revenue had increased that much. I I remember a point in time when their grazing revenues, <laughs> their, their grazing leases and their oil and gas leases provided them uh, about the same amount of income. Uh, and, and I guess uh, from their point of view, uh, looking at recharging aquifers, which is a use of land, and looking at the distribution of water either for urban uses in Midland or, or Odessa, I'm guessing, uh, or agriculture means that they're drawing increasing value from water. As I remember, Texas Pacific land enjoys a land and minerals estate of almost a million acres. Uh, and that million acres is in the Permian Basin, which is one of the great oil producing basins in the United States. Uh, it's also extraordinarily water short. And provision of water to uh, urban uses, provision of water to the alfalfa industry, the cotton industry, and the cattle industry, uh, I suspect is a very good business for them. I hadn't been aware of the fact that that's the truth. There's an odd corporate structure. It's a trust, but it's a self-governing trust. And the articles of the incorporation of the trust were intended to prevent a takeover. So the realization of the net present value of income streams over time is sort of precluded by the structure of the business. I own it because I love royalty businesses. And I look at their land estate, and if you overlie that with the great shale basins in the United States, there's a wonderful correlation. I hadn't been aware of the water angle, frankly. Uh, it's certainly very interesting. In terms of their corporate structure, I believe they may be, if they haven't already, they're looking at changing it to a C-Corp because they're looking to get added to the S&P 500. Um, so it seems to be part of a, a phasing transition that the, the company just seems to keep evolving and evolving. It there, are makes some shareholders, me... there are some shareholders, myself included, who would love to see that happen. Okay. Uh, whether or not the company is sold... Uh, I don't think should be the providence of management. I think it should be the providence of owners. <laughs> and there are some owners who are trying to cause that to occur, both through votes of the common shareholders, but also through the courts. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder, we're talking about water. Uh, are we really talking about land uh, through which the water runs? Well, the nature of water law in most of the United States ties the water to the land. 
Uh, as an example, I used to criticize J.G. Boswell for their focus on water as an agricultural commodity. I was wrong, and Boswell was right. If you own the land and you own the pertinent water right, if you change the approved use of the land uh, from agriculture to, say, single-family residential, you automatically retitle the water. <laughs> and the easiest way in terms of the legislature for J.G. Boswell to upgrade the value of the water right was to change the use of the land. Uh, Is that I, difficult I was, to do uh, in terms, do you need municipality approval? Uh, for yeah, something yeah like no, that? you absolutely need that. And yeah. so you do it, you do it during times of uh, economic turmoil. You go to a place like Tulare County, California and say, uh, unfortunately, you guys are broke. Uh, I have 20,000 acres that I would like to upzone, and I'll pay you a fee. And surprisingly, the legislature becomes much more pliable when you discuss a fee during periods of time when they need a fee. Money talks. Yeah, and the Boswells <laughs> have played this game pretty well. Yeah, that's, well, you see that. <laughs> now, I, 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 like to say I'm not I like to say I'm not cynical. I'm old. But I'll, I'll leave it to your viewers. <laughs> oh. It's a fine line between cynical and skeptical. Well, on that last note, um, talk to me about Midland County, where it looks like one of the next phases for Texas Pacific could be development in that area. It, exactly uh, that which you just mentioned. Is that part of your uh, thinking for the company moving forward so they can uh, it, gain it? Has, it has, in fact, been part of my thinking. I watched... Uh, landowners in the state of Nevada, as an example, uh, trade some of their rural land to the BLM for urban land <laughs> around Las Vegas. Uh, and I watched the progression of valuation that came. And by the way, um, Midland County, let's just say it's not a place where you'd like to be a farmer most times. Uh, it is tough to graze cattle. The place doesn't have grass. And it's tough to grow cotton in a place that doesn't have water. Uh, it is not a tough place to find employment in the oil and gas business. And it's a place where if you do find employment, it's nice to be able to have a house for your family. So the urbanization uh, all, all through the Permian, all the way west to Lee County, New Mexico, all the way through the Permian and Del Delaware Basins, but particularly it, it, around Midland and Odessa, uh, because incomes have been so high and because despite the best wishes of the big thinkers like the Bidens, uh, the oil industry looks to be a strong industry for the next 30 years. The urbanization of Midland is continuing apace. And I uh, promise final question uh, before I uh, sit back. H how do you go about the valuation for such a, an evolving company? Like, How do you sit down and, and really value this business and, and what it might be worth in the future and compare that to its current pricing? Some of the parts. It's very, very, very hard. I, uh, it, it is easy, well, comparatively easy to look at their filing documents and look at the proved developed producing reserves that they have royalty interests on and uh, try, based on past production levels, to anticipate future production levels and the royalties thereon. You construct then a pricing matrix. Uh, matrix. I use three different prices. Uh, and, and I determine from my own outlook uh, a realistic, a conservative, and an aggressive appraisal. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the sum of the parts, you look at the land leases that they're enjoying uh, with their agricultural tenants. I hold them flat. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to know. I, and holding them flat has yielded a good result for me because they've been able to exact higher rent, land rents. And I guess now, uh, with an uncertain political climate, what you would probably do is hold their water revenues steady to be conservative and then assign a net present valuation to it. Uh, it you would need to, on almost a plat-by-plat -plat basis, uh, try to figure out what developable land, single-family residential land, uh, is, worth in the, is worth in the environs of Midland. It's important to understand, too, as a large-scale developer, something I learned uh, with Boswell, it isn't just adding value through retitling grazing land uh, as single-family residential. 
it's the retention and the development of the commercial land that becomes serviced by those households that adds value. I remember thinking when Boswell uh, developed uh, a big piece of land in San Diego County, that once the single family sales were done, that the value had been achieved. <laughs> Way wrong. Uh, the commercial, uh, which they developed but didn't sell, <laughs> has continued to yield rents, uh, exorbitant rents, <laughs> ever since. So those are the gifts that keep on giving. I, I guess the bottom line answer to your question is it requires a lot of work uh, and you're never going to get the answer right. You just need to understand that by doing that work, you get the answer more right than most of your competitors. Good. Yeah. Not going to lie. I was, I was scratching my head on this one. Yeah. Yeah. That was... <laughs> uh, so Rick, um, it sounds like, so do you do a lot of uh, um, asset base valuations, uh, discount cash flow? Or are you more of a, price to earnings it seemed like you do it all you know what i'm saying but, i'm not yeah. a price to earnings guy mm -hmm. uh, because most of the businesses i'm in the earnings go to earnings heaven they deplete uh, if you are you know if you have a mine that's got a 10-year mine life and you're doing pe uh, pretty soon you got all p and no e and that's really unpleasant so i do net present value calculations and there was a point in time in my youth where I knew I worked harder than other people and I had a better education around this. Uh, I accept now I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, I just try and get closer than the other fella. There are some circumstances out there where unless the world changes really, really, really dramatically, that you don't have to be close uh, because the big picture is close enough relative to the probabilities. I'm thinking names like ExxonMobil. It would take real skill to screw up ExxonMobil. And the corporate culture around ExxonMobil doesn't exhibit that kind of skill. They exhibit good skills. Uh, I don't need to do an exhaustive net present value on Exxon's PDP. And I don't need to do a price earnings discussion of their refining and marketing and chemicals business. Uh, I just need to know that they've been a superb allocator of capital that they're making sufficient reinvestment, uh, sustaining capital reinvestment in the upstream business, that they have a great big discovery in Guyana where there's uh, access to 11 billion barrels. You know, uh, I don't have to get it right. Uh, what I have to do is I have to get it more right than other people. And I have to have the courage during periods of time when COVID takes the oil price down to unsustainably low levels and Exxon gets kicked out of the Dow Jones 30 and you have all that index selling. I have to have the courage to make a big, big, big bet, uh, knowing that I'm wrong on some part of the bet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so um, just transitioning a little bit to, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I did want to touch on agriculture. Um, we did have, uh, you know, obviously the Russia-Ukraine war and all of that, um, the amount of fertilizers and such that come out of those areas, wheat and such. Um what what are you seeing there? Is, are there any opportunities you see in that in that sector? Well, I think the uh, uh, I, I think the big integrated fertilizer producers, if you're willing to own them for the long term, are a no miss business. There's eight billion of us on the planet. Uh, there are still substantial calorie deficits in a lot of places, and the only way we can sustain eight billion people on Earth is through the green, the green Revolution. You know, for those of us on the call and some of the people who listen to us, you know, we want to go to Whole Foods and Boy Organic and all this kind of stuff. You can't feed 8 billion people with high-quality broccoli. You just can't do it. Uh, you got to give folks calories. And the way you do that is with inputs. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, diammonium phosphate fertilizer uh, ammonia, potash, and phosphate is the way you feed 8 billion people. A and you can be part of that value chain wherever you want. You can be a potash miner, you know, a, a sort of a nutrient, or you can be a, a ammonia producer, uh, or you can be a blender, or you can be a distributor, or you can be all of the above. Uh, I believe that eventually we are going to solve the political difficulty in the Ukraine, at least I hope we do. And when that happens, the potash prices are going to crash. <laughs> I mean, that's going to happen. 
uh, we're going to go from a period of uh, undersupply to oversupply. At the same time, I believe that the uh, unusually depressed price of U.S. natural gas is going to correct, uh, which means that the ultra cheap nitrogen nitrogen that the world is enjoying is going to go up in price. Uh, what is going to continue is that the low cost producers into markets that can afford to buy fertilizer are going to continue to do well. I continue to like the U.S. fertilizer business because the United States has superb advantages in agriculture, in particular, this wonderful thing called the Mississippi River. We run inputs up the river. It's much cheaper to float this stuff than to take it over the highway. <laughs> and we take our grain exports out the river. Uh, we have wonderful soils in the United States. We have wonderful weather in the United States. Uh, we have wonderful capital markets in the United States. We have the best infrastructure in the world with regards to agriculture in the United States. And we have this wonderful thing called the Mississippi River. So if I had to choose an input company operating anywhere in the world, I would cho choose one who was operating in the eastern half of the United States. It had the advantage of the, you know, the Mississippi River. I don't want to sell into Iowa and Ohio, you know, all, all those places. But that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities other places. I'm just old enough. I don't have to own everything anymore. Uh, I, I want to own the biggest and the best and the ones that I understand the most and the ones with the highest probability of paying me dividends into my dotage. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Go ahead, you know, for a younger person, you probably would want to focus on Brazil uh, or Nigeria or Argentina. I'm not a younger person <laughs> and I don't want to relearn the lessons in Brazil <laughs> that I learned in Louisiana. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ben. No, I feel like the uh, I feel like the organic comment was directed my way just because I'm wearing a, a headband. But uh, I'll have you know I'm a I'm a straight shooter when it comes to to diet. Speaking of those advantages that you mentioned, uh, relative value in U.S. vertically integrated um, plays on this theme. How do you see CF Industries versus say Mosaic in terms of um, Would you have a, I a preference prefer, for one over the other? Yeah, I prefer Mosaic because it's a larger business with better integration. They seem to be able, as an example, like an integrated oil company, to produce the stuff, distribute the stuff, and sell the stuff. And they seem to be able to add value at every juncture, uh, like Nutrien. Uh, I have never had the ability to operate three businesses simultaneously. So in addition to being impressed, I'm envious. Uh, but I like businesses with a diversity of supply and a diversity of outcomes if they can be well managed. CF has a, you know, CF is a wonderful, uh, a, a, I think a wonderful business. Uh, and they have a good market. They have, uh, installed infrastructure that would be expensive and probably impossible to replicate, but the rest of them do too. And it seems to be like that key ingredient of um, of gas being used for ammonia based fertilizers. Is 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 this really the best way to play the gas theme in, in the US, or one of the better ways? Because the gas market's the widow maker. Uh, have you got a little bit more? Uh, is there more forgiveness in, in these type of uh, this end of the value chain? Uh, I would not want to be a consumer of US natural gas five years from now. I would not want to be reliant on the cost advantage of U.S. natural gas because we're building infrastructure to internationalize our gas market like crazy. Uh, I would like to be an owner, and I am an owner, of U.S. natural gas reserves. These very, very, very low prices correct themselves. We're building billions of dollars worth of infrastructure to address the delta between the BTU price of American natural gas and global energy. American natural gas will show up as finished products like ammonia in foreign markets, but it'll also show up as liquefied or compressed natural gas. And the delta between the BTU price of U.S. natural gas and Canadian natural gas, by the way, and global energy will shrink. Maybe not disappear, but shrink. Certainly, we've spoken about L the LNG play in the past. Uh, do we have time for the Shania story? I've been wanting to ask you about that for a while, knowing that you wrote the Save the Company check. And uh, if if we have time, I'd love to hear the story. Well, that's that's a that's a from my standpoint a wonderful story because it has such a happy ending for me. Uh, there's a genius named Sharif Suki who had been in the 
North American conventional natural gas industry. And he noted that at the point in time he did it before the shale plays, before the basin centric plays, that the cost of uh, developing and finding natural gas reserves uh, was very, very, very high. And natural gas reserves were available elsewhere in the world. They were stranded. They couldn't be sold. And so Sharif decided that he would build uh, plants which could accept liquefied natural gas, convert them into regular natural gas, and sell them into the U.S. market, particularly in the refining belt in South Texas and New Mexico. And he began to, to seek political approval to build these liquefaction or deliquefaction plants long before anybody else recognized the problem. As he became successful with this, and as the big utilities looked to access natural gas that the United States in those days couldn't produce, the ascribed value of what Sharif had done became very high. But before that was apparent, uh, he ran out of money. It, he was in this political process where it was all outgo and no income. Uh, being aware of the same problem that he was, which is to say the high cost of exploration and development in conventional natural gas, uh, I had the courage to write uh, a save the company check. If my memory serves me well, it was a 75 cent check or something for 2 million bucks. And mercifully, for one of the few times in my life, I really truly got ahead of a curve for the wrong reasons. Uh, I remember with delight reading a Goldman Sachs research report five or six years later, recommending the stock as deeply undervalued at $40, uh, which if you have a 75 cent basis is about as much fun as you can have with your clothes on, you know, well, at 70, it's the most fun you can have. But um, <laughs> what's ironic about the whole thing is that the high prices that were being paid for American natural gas stimulated incredible advances in technology and geology to the extent now that we produce so much natural gas as a byproduct of oil production that the same plants that Sharif was building to import natural gas are now used to export natural gas. <laughs> so I, I enjoyed a tremendous success for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> You'll take it. I, I've had other things where I think I was a total failure for all the right reasons. And so I'm much more attracted to stories that have a happy ending. Yeah, and Nassim Taleb does say I'd rather be lucky than intelligent. Uh, I'm assuming I'm assuming there was a warrant involved in this structure. There was. Can I ask about the the structure of this financing? And to be honest, I don't remember the warrant. I just know that if you have a reasonably priced warrant, maybe it was a buck and a half, maybe it was a double, uh, in a twenty or thirty dollar bid market, uh, it, it's a very very pleasant circumstance. And, and Sharif, by the way, were he describing me, would describe me as lucky as opposed to smart. I'm not so sure. I would describe him as lucky and smart. No, I'm I'm very attracted to Sharif. We he does comment on my perverse good timing. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> well, Rick, uh, you have a um a uh royalty and streaming uh boot camp coming up. So I want to give you a chance to share anything with the audience. Well, I expect you to be there, first of all. Uh the royalty and streaming business is the best of the natural resources business. Uh, a royalty is an economic interest in an ore body or, or an oil field that bears no capital responsibility. So you don't pay the development costs. You don't pay the sustaining costs. You don't pay the operating costs. You just get a check. Your gross is your net. And that's a lot of fun. A stream is not quite so good. It's a prepaid right to receive a part of the product stream uh, at a predetermined cost, often half market. Uh, again, you really, really, really can determine your margins and you aren't responsible for either operating costs or capital cost blowouts. Uh, and this area of investing has become popular precisely because it's been successful in the past. I noticed grading about 80,000 portfolios in the last six years that there are a lot of people who own royalty and streaming stocks that don't know a damn thing about royalty and streaming. So while I would like people to increase the proportion of royalty and streaming stocks in their portfolio, I want to arm them with the knowledge uh, to do it successfully. As you know, Daryl, we've done three prior boot camps where we take eight or nine hour deep dives into a topic and give people the background to understand reasonably well how to make investment decisions, whether or not they choose to employ the lessons that we taught them. 
we begin with an overview of the topic that puts the rest of the discussion into context. In the Royalty and Streaming Bootcamp, that overview is going to be given by a longtime friend of mine, Doug Silver, who is partially responsible for inventing the public company royalty structure in the United States. He's been in that business for 30 years and stupidly successful. Uh, it's important to note, too, that it's impossible for anybody in the eight or nine hours that we devote to the topic to assume, to assimilate all of the information that we impart. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you will have uh, access to the tapes online for a full year after the symposium. As an example, with the uranium boot camp, I should know about uranium. I put on the damn boot camp. Uh, I've had to play those tapes back four times to absorb all the information myself having put on the boot camp. This is intense, deep stuff. You got to work hard. Uh, we charge you $99 for this. And I believe that the overview, just Doug Silver's talk is worth $99. But if at the end of the boot camp you think you haven't got your $99 worth, just email me and I'll give you your $99 back. The financial risk associated with the boot camp is all mine. I assume there's going to be a link uh, in this video down to the boot camp. As I say, if you intend to be a natural resource investor, you need to learn about royalty and streaming, and you need to learn about it before you've allocated too much capital in the sector. I humbly believe the best way you can do that is in my boot camp, and I'm taking the financial risk for you. It's $99. If for any reason you don't think you got your $99 worth, let me know. I'll give you your $99 back. It's important to note in 28 years of making that money back guarantee, I've had to refund about one-tenth of 1% 1 of the tuition charged. These are very, very, very high quality uh, educational courses. Mm. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, anything else you got, Ben, before we close out? Uh, no, just to say that I'm excited to uh, to learn about the royalty and streaming uh, through the boot camp. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I always appreciate it, by the way, if people attend those boot camps. If they have ideas about how we can deliver more value and improve the product, please let us know. Yep, for sure. And that, that'll be in the link in the description below. Thank you, Rick, for your time. I always appreciate you coming on the show. Gentlemen, my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.